Howdy again everyone, and today I'm excited to be handling a camera lens I've been dreaming about testing for many years now, the Canon EF 50mm f1.0 L USM, L for legendary in this case, I think. It was made between 1989 and 2002 when it was discontinued, and eventually replaced by the simpler and much cheaper 50mm f1.2 L lens, which is still being made today. For making this review finally happen, I want to say a huge thank you to Park Cameras, a major retailer who are based here in the UK. They allowed me to borrow this legendary optic from their used camera department for a couple of weeks for testing. Check out their website and YouTube channel in the description below. This is a lens so revolutionary that even today, 30 years later, it holds the crown of being the brightest aperture full frame autofocus lens ever made, and the brightest aperture digital SLR lens ever made. Its successful development was a monumentous achievement for Canon and their new EF mount system back in 1989, and they showed it off as much as possible, much to the chagrin of Nikon owners. It was also an incredibly difficult lens for Canon to make, with its very complex optical formula involving two ground aspherical elements, and thus it cost about US$4,000 when it was first released, way out of reach of even a lot of professional photographers back then, and so it never sold all that well. Even nowadays, it commands prices of at least £3,000 on eBay, and you may want to spend a bit more than that for a good copy of the lens, as Canon won't service it anymore, sadly. And the images it can get are, of course, pretty spectacular. Your backgrounds at f1.0 are very deeply out of focus, and your shutter speeds are pretty amazing, too. Here it is, compared to my Canon 50mm f1.4 lens on the right. As you can see from the shutter speeds, the f1.0 lens lets in exactly twice as much light as its younger f1.4 brother. And of course, you can see that its backgrounds are dramatically more out of focus too, and the f1.0 lens gives a slightly nicer looking image when stopped down to f1.4 too, in my opinion. As you can see here, f1.0 is twice as bright as f1.4 and 66% brighter than f1.2, so using this old legacy lens can really give you an advantage, if you can get it correctly in focus. Remember, at f1.0, your depth of field is razor thin. Let's start by looking at the lens's build quality. Anyone who's used one of Canon's 85mm f1.2 L lenses will be instantly familiar with this, as it uses the same lens body. It's from the days when Canon still made their L lenses out of metal, and it feels amazing as a result, really solid, with a lovely tactile finish to it, and it weighs just over a kilogram. Look at that stunning rear glass element, there's nothing else quite like it. I don't recommend putting the lens down on its rear, you really want to keep that glass scratch free. And the lens is a little too early to have weather sealing. The glass elements also have a slightly unusual yellow tint to them, the coatings are specially optimised for this lens's unique optics. The main control point is the focus ring. Unusually for its time, it's a focus by wire mechanism electronically coupled to the lens's focus motor, but it works smoothly and really responsively if you shoot in manual focus mode, feeling as if it's actually mechanically connected. Bear in mind that a fully electronic focus system could be a huge problem if your lens's focus motor breaks. Remember, Canon don't service this optic anymore. The autofocus motor is a little slow, making a whooshing sound as it goes. Again though, for 1989 I'm not complaining at all. I tested the lens on my old Canon 6D, and through the viewfinder its accuracy was not very good, but in live view it worked. But I found myself adapting the lens onto my new Canon EOS R camera, where autofocus worked spectacularly confidently and accurately, and Canon's eye autofocus feature was particularly useful too. Here's the noise the autofocus motor makes through your camera's microphone when you're shooting video.
So the autofocus works well for video, but that noise means you'll definitely want to use an off-camera microphone for sound. Some good news for video makers is that this lens doesn't exhibit too much in the way of focus breathing. Here I'm pulling focus at f16, and the lens seems to zoom in just a little as you focus closer. Originally, the lens came with a special case and a hood, but this copy seems to have lost those along the way. The lens does not have image stabilization. Overall, well, back in 1989, most photographers would have wondered if this thing had fallen from a spaceship, and even today, its build quality is really exceptional, and its autofocus works very well in live view mode, especially on Canon's latest dual pixel autofocus cameras. All right now, let's look at image quality. I was nervous about this. Even back in the days of film, this lens had a reputation for being quite soft, and Canon's official published MTF charts of the time don't sing a pretty tune either. And modern digital SLR camera sensors are pretty demanding. This time I'm using my Canon EOS R, a 30 megapixel full frame camera. I should also note that, sadly, Canon don't publish aberration correction profiles for this lens, so these and all the other pictures in this review are taken without corrections. Ok, here's the middle of the frame at f1.0. As you can see, it's possible to pick out some resolution, but it really is fairly soft overall with ghosting and, and low contrast. The sharpness remains about this good throughout most of the image frame, but image quality in the far corners completely falls apart. Stop down to f1.4 for a little more clarity in those corners, but a lot more contrast back in the middle, and stop down to f2 for a dramatic improvement though, with quite strong image quality in the middle now, and a small improvement in the corners. Stop down to f2.8 for a dramatic improvement in the corners now, and great sharpness back in the middle. Stop down to f4 for perfection in the middle, and decent image quality in the corners, albeit with some notable chromatic aberration. At f5.6 the corners are a little sharper again, and the lens stays this sharp down to about f11 or so. Well, that was interesting, and a little disappointing. At f1.0 the lens is really quite soft, but if you're willing to add a lot of contrast and sharpness in editing, then you'll still get some usable images. I hope you'll forgive me for not testing this on my 42 megapixel Sony a7R2 camera, or one of my APS-C cameras. I think you can imagine from the test results just presented that they probably won't look too great. Ok then, let's move on and look at distortion and vignetting on a full frame camera. The lens projects some noticeable barrel distortion, and at f1.0, very strong vignetting is visible in the corners. It's still there at f1.4 and f2, although it's pushed right into the edges. It's pushed into the edges more at f2.8 and f4, but unfortunately, you'll always see a little bit of darkness right in those edges. This lens can focus as closely as about 60 centimeters from your subject, further than average, really. Close-up image quality is a little softer at f1.0, and still quite soft at f1.4. Stop down to f2 though, for some resolution, and at f2.8, we see some decent contrast emerging. This lens is particularly famous for its unusual behaviour when confronted with bright lights in your images, and as you can see here, its flaring is quite something to behold. Not only do we catch a whole ton of flaring, but we are treated to some pretty rainbows flying around the place. Your lens will catch those rainbows quite often from any bright lights when shooting in the dark. I didn't bother testing for coma smearing, because the image corners are too soft, so let's move on and look at bokeh. The bokeh potential for a full frame 50mm f1.0 lens is obviously amazing, so how do those out of focus backgrounds actually look? Well really, you could write a book about the quality of this lens's bokeh, it's all over the place. I don't mind it myself at all. Those backgrounds are thrown out of focus so powerfully that the outlining and unusual shapes which sometimes give this lens its particular look at f1.0 seem pretty cool to me, although it is of course a question of taste. 
Overall then, a fascinating lens. I was more impressed by its build quality than its rather soft image quality. It's possible that I was testing a slightly soft copy of the lens though, it's hard to tell. If you plan to shoot at f1.0, then you will get some spectacular images, but you'll want to add plenty of extra sharpness and contrast afterwards to beef them up. Is this a lens I would seek to buy for myself? I've been tempted in the past by it. It is unbelievably cool to have such a bright aperture lens which also has autofocus, not to mention useful too. It's also a slightly tempting lens for video makers. The autofocus system works great with Canon's modern cameras and the extra bright aperture can always be useful. But the pixel peeper in me needs something a bit sharper, I'm afraid to say, so I'm giving this one a pass myself. Still, a really fascinating and still usable piece of kit, one that's getting rarer and rarer nowadays. Wouldn't it be amazing if Canon made a new one for the 21st century?